first of all, I got to I got to give you guys a thank you. Thank you to all the great football fans and kids in this nation that love this game and that you guys are giving back and helping the youth football programs at the high school level and I'm sure before that too because it's a sport sometimes that's under attack and it's the greatest game. I mean, I love it. I've been a part of it for three decades. Never got to play. I regret it every day. What you guys are doing is is awesome. You and wouldn't have been very good anyway. <laughs> I was asking, what Coach position Pete? would he have played? I, mean, I, I saw hey, you work out. I what position? I, I, <laughs> hey, Coach Dundon, I, I, I'm not coachable. That's, that's the problem. I'm not coachable. Uh, how, how much a kick are you getting out of this? You know, and you guys just chime in. You know, you got, probably should start with the head coach here of Carmel High School. The head coach, Jason McKee. Um, the, the thing I get a kick out of is seeing kids who have been in our program since they were freshmen and now seeing them as seniors, uh, seeing how they've matured in school, in the classroom, and obviously seeing how they've developed on the football field and just see them take that journey and just to be a part of that journey, um, you know, in that transition from boys to men, it's, it's so much gratitude and to see them have success on the field or putting in so much work, uh, that's where I get joy. Um, and then when they go off to college, if they get a scholarship, whether it's athletic or academic, uh, for me, it's like, you know, me making it all over again. So just to see that um, is great. And obviously I have a good supporting cast. Um, Rasheed Davis, Owen Crutes, the coaches we have at Carmel Catholic High School, uh, do a great job. So it's all of us as a unit. Um, you know, support system is really good there. And, and that's, that's the excitement that I get out of it. Watching the same kids that we, we had since we started as a freshman and we were getting our heads kicked in and, you know, watching them cry on the field after games, you know, because they, they're trying so hard and not having any success. And then this year we're like playing really well onto the third round of the playoffs. And and now I mean I had this shirt made because I used to tell them that they believed in monsters, right? You guys believe everybody else is the monster. You believe in monsters. The problem is you need to start believing you are the monster, right? And so now when we uh, made it to the playoffs this year, I had these hoodies made. To, to signify that you have made that transition from being afraid of everybody to everybody being afraid to play you. Double A, you're a volunteer coach, right? You have a son at Stevenson High School trying to uh, fit the image of his dad as a as defensive lineman. Uh, and you had a great career as a second round pick out of Penn State and a long NFL career. Uh, why are you doing it, number one? And number two, what are you getting out of it? Well, at first I did it just to be closer to my son, but then um, as I started coaching him, um, I started gravitating towards these kids. And just like how, you know, J-Mac was saying, you just, you grow attached to them and their journeys and how much they've grown up. And um, I also volunteer coach for the wrestling team too, even though I, I didn't have a wrestling team, I never wrestled, I just know that Wrestlers do very good in football because they understand angles, they understand leverage, they understand how to conserve their energy and all that stuff. So um, I started, you know, taking a liking to the kids and, you know, just how hard they work or just how some of them listen, how some of them apply themselves, how some of them just go out on the field and be like, oh, I did the move that you told me to do and it worked, whatever, blah, blah, blah. So. You know, it just makes you want to come out there every day and just teach them something. Yeah, you tried to teach Big Cat something when you walked in. You got into that little wrestling move. He didn't know what to do. You know, Cat looked at you. He'd never seen anything like that before. <laughs> Don't hurt him, Big Cat. Don't hurt him, Big Cat. James. Go to your trap, take over your trap. Why are you doing it? Football was very life-altering for me. Um, I didn't start playing until I was a junior in high school. That was the first time I ever played organized football. And the camaraderie and the ability to kind of leave the world behind um, is what football brought to me. I don't coach in a neighborhood right now that needs a lot of that, but I have in the past. And to like these guys say, watch these kids grow, watch these kids learn. Um, whether it be a kid that has the potential to go to college, whether it be a small college or a big college. Um, as a coach, I kind of feel like we're obligated to teach them these things that can help them move forward in something that helped me move forward. You, you get a lot of different types of people in football. 
You get the kids that are trying to escape something. You get the kids that are trying to make friends. You get the kids that have no idea what football is all about. You know, but as you watch them grow, as you watch them learn, as you watch them start to bond together, you start to realize the things that made football so special to you. Bloom Townships, Kasim Zincino. Uh, what's your role and how long have you been doing it? Took over the head coaching position last uh, spring in about March at Bloom Township. Started as just the head coach and then about a month or so ago, started to integrate into the school and took a role as the freshman success coach, basically dealing with freshmen that are four times more likely to have success in high school if you get to them the first three or four months of their arrival in school. So that's kind of my role as far as that goes. Uh, why I took the position was after a flicker four year, four five years ago at St. Pat's with my son, uh, <clears throat> he was going to be playing football for the first time in ninth grade. His mom was a little leery of the fact he had never played football at all. So I said I was going to not only show him the game outside of football, but try to get a role inside the school where I could actively teach him and others the game. What happened after that just changed me as a person. Um, it was like a chemical release that hadn't been there for 15 years after being in corporate America and worrying about money and business deals, which was another side of me, which I always wanted to bring out and knew I had the skills to do, but football was always overriding that. So when I came to that point, I did, and got to the point where I opened my own business, um, sold it a couple of years ago, and was able to be in the position where I was ready to kind of do that second career deal. What, what do you want to really do? Not just what your pocket or what your dreams want you to do. I pinpointed the South Side for a reason. After coming out of Spanish Harlem in the Bronx, where I grew up, where things were kind of the same, I wanted to be in that community. My son and I went to St. Pat's, a very nurturing, very <clears throat> you know, financially wealthy community where some of those outside forces don't reach the kids. I wanted to reach those kids that really needed it. So not only is it fruitful just to get back to football, to get back to the kids that maybe came up like me and who need a little bit of a hand around their shoulders on this journey to become a man. St. Rita Hall of Famer over here, Ahmad Merritt. Each year, every year, I, I uh, always find at least one kid on our team that you can just tell that they really need this. You know, a cat alluded to it. I'm sorry, James alluded to it. <laughs> but uh, you always find that one kid that, um, that really, really needs this, right? You, don't, you never know what they go home to, right? You never really know. And I grew up on the south side of Chicago, and, um, <clears throat> and Kasim, you could probably speak to this, but uh, uh, we, my dad was at Morgan Park High School, and they, they could have practice or they could not have practice. They never knew how many kids were going to show up. You know, all the family issues that these kids had, um, whether or not they could get to and from practice after practice was over was an issue right, because of all the violence and the things that were going on in the community. Um, and uh, now being in Lake Forest, we don't really have those issues. However, there are one or two kids that always has something going on at home. And to be able to connect with that kid and uh, watch him just hang on your every word and you can feel that you are a, a figure to that kid and, and you're setting an example. Um, gives you huge gratitude, at least for me. Well, you know, I've done features on some of you guys when you were wearing a Bears uniform, so I know a little bit about your backgrounds, but you all touched on something about where you came from. And so south side of Chicago, tough part of Detroit. Uh, I mean, tough, tough part of Detroit. Pensacola, tough, tough LA area. And your story is crazy because you didn't even know if you were gonna be playing football. You just kind of walked into it in junior college with your with your cousin, right? Yeah. yeah. Big Cat, Pittsburgh, right? And then you just uh, talked about Spanish Harlem. How, how hard was it in your uh, respective environments to get to where you are today? And do you really focus on any particular mentor, coach, or whatever that helped you get here from those tough areas? Start with Cat. 
my grandparents were very influential in my life, um, as well as my parents. I was one of those kids that used my grandparents' address to go to a different school, so I didn't go to the school in my neighborhood. Wasn't gonna go to college. My godmother and my grandfather, and along with my parents, decided, you know, go up to this place called Cheney State. My godmother knew somebody up there. Grandfather took me up there to meet him, met him. They said they could get me enrolled in school. He drove back home six hours, grabbed my bag, drove back, dropped my bag off and said, see you at the end of the semester. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, different, different things are entrenched in each and every one of us. I learned a lot going to that small school. I mean, I got to college and couldn't bench 135. You know, and as a big guy, that's saying a lot. Um, but I got with the right people. They taught me how to do things, some things the right way. And I was able to move on from there. Uh, wanted to transfer out at one point in time and had a coach sit me down, me and a couple other guys down. And he was like, you know, if you can make it from here, you can make it from anywhere. And that really stuck. And then I met Rod Graves. And, you know, Rod Graves was another guy that kind of popped into my life and gave me advice along the way and helped me along this journey. So I've had people, you know, my parents, my grandparents, uh, you know, coaches from college, coaches here, you know, that have helped me along the way. Both my parents were in Chicago public schools. They were teachers. So growing up, um, my mom was at Robeson High School, dad at Morgan Park High School. <clears throat> and uh, I went, we would go to all the games, you know, I would go to the games with my parents. I remember going, also going to a lot of uh, uh, funerals of my mom's students, right? guys that we had just saw on the football field the week before and the next week she was taking me to that kid's you know funeral so it was super duper rough with that being said she made it she made a a, a conservative effort to make sure that I go to a school outside of Chicago public school system so while we lived in the city and St. Rita obviously is in the city um, <clears throat> my mom made an effort to uh, uh, try to get me into one of these Catholic schools. And fortunately enough, St. Rita was able to um, see me do some things on the basketball court, oddly enough. I grew up, it was just my mom and me, because uh, my dad went to prison, not jail. He went to prison, like maximum security, like when I was four. So I didn't have like no father figure growing up. So. Uh, and I was the only child, so I felt like once I started playing football, my teammates became my brothers. And I had like a lot of father figures and coaches and, you know, my pastor and uh, my trainer. Like everybody always gave me great advice. And uh, my mom saw something in me where she was like, you should play football. But in my, in my neighborhood, all we did was play basketball because Detroit pissed like, you know, Joe Dumars, Isaiah Thomas, John South, Dennis Rodman. So we were always playing old. basketball. Yeah, I'm old. Yeah, I'm old. You the same age. Man said Joe Dumars. <laughs> Joe Dumars. Yeah, but that's all we did was hoop. So uh, my mom was like, you should try to play football. Like, I was playing Nintendo, and I get upset at the game. I throw the joystick. I'm throwing chairs and everything around. She's like, you need to do something with all that aggression. You play some ball. So I took a test to get into one of the top schools, the top high schools in Detroit. And I went to uh, Martin Luther King. So once my mom knew that, then she just dropped me off at a practice one day. <laughs> Dude, I wasn't even ready. This story cracks me I up. had on and jean shorts. Right I had on like some Air Force Ones or something like that. And like a tank top or something like that. And I got out the car and my mom was like, introduce yourself to that coach right there. <laughs> So, but it's like a bunch of coaches right there. So I'm like, I'm turning around like, what coach you talking about, ma? And by the time I turned around, my mom, 
it like she left. So the door from her hitting the gas was what closed the door. I didn't even close the door. Like just heard like skirting off is what closed. So I was like, man. So I went and introduced myself to the coach. Man, and ever since then, off. man, like I, I have been playing, man. But you know, oh uh, my God. like all the assistant coaches and everything, like they saw something in me. Cause I was just like real coachable. Cause I didn't know what I was doing. They told me to line up at guard, and I promise, I said point guard or shooting guard. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what a guard was. I knew what a running back was, a wide receiver, a quarterback, but a guard? A tackle? Oh, That's man. what you do. You tackle people. Right. <laughs> what do you mean, tackle? <laughs> it's an offensive tackle? You t I, thought you, I thought you had to be on defense to tackle. Oh, gosh. So they're like, yeah, line up at tackle. <laughs> and I'm like, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Bronx man. Yeah, growing up in the Bronx, uh, like I said, Spanish Harlem was tough. 33rd floor of a project. It was right by the East River. It was called River Park Towers. It sounds glamorous, but uh, really wasn't that glamorous. My PS229 school was, was right downstairs. It was basically a little community where you could get food, go to school, do everything right there. It was kind of built like that to keep these people right here. So that's kind of how I grew up for the first 12 years. Um, there was a park downstairs, Roberto Clemente Park. Famous baseball player, obviously learned a lot about him. He was very obviously big in Spanish Harlem at that time coming up. And uh, there was a lot of mentors and people there. My, my dad was at home a lot. He worked at odd jobs, this and that and the other. It was kind of uh, <clears throat> coming up in the 80s in the Bronx. So that part of his street life was always there. My mom uh, was a secretary in Manhattan. You can see Manhattan from the other side of the water at night. My dad used to say, you see all those lights over there? That's where all the money is. He's like, I want you to figure out how to get over there. Um, so the first 12 years of my life was pretty much that until my mom got mugged for the third time. And my dad was like, it's time to get out of here. So we moved upstate in New York, the Catskill area, small school. Liberty New York went to a culture shock of, you know, basically inner city in the 80s in the Bronx, all the way to the mountains, Tri Valley, all these roundout valley, all these nice schools and trees and civilized folks. So that started a transformation in me as a young man. Um, as far as playing football, that was the first time I played football. Like a lot of guys said, basketball was the vehicle in the Bronx. If you'd have a basketball in your hand, it was part of your identity. It's part of your respect. Um, if you could play basketball at that time in the Bronx. So when I started to play football, like a lot of guys said, it was all of that pent up aggression coming out in the sport that I could funnel. And, and as long as I did it between the whistles and took care of my responsibility, the added aggression was up to me from taking care of my brother sometimes for weeks at a time. Um, to really, really needing a light at that time in my life. So football started to take off. Basketball segued me into it. Um, by 10th grade, was met, met my AD, who was Floyd Emery, came out of his AD position to coach. He was almost retired. He was like, this kid's a bright light. We got 110 graduating class, school in the middle of nowhere, but I'm going to come out just to show this kid some love because I think he... I think he has a chance. Send my tape to Syracuse. Tape started to get fluctuated all over. Became an All-American at tight end position and, and the rest was, was history. But Floyd Emery was that guy that really helped turn that ship around. I want to make sure of everybody's sort of story, but like Big Cat, I didn't play till late. I didn't play until, really until college. I had one year that I played as a sophomore in high school, but I didn't really play, so nobody ever remembers that I had on shoulder pads. I was tiny. I'm like, you know, I'm the smallest guy on the, the, the set right here today. Like some of these guys that grew up in the inner city, I grew up in South Central L.A. Uh, during the 80s, during like, I always tell people, if you want to know what I like, L.A. was like when I grew up, just watch Minister Society, Boys in the Hood. Or, I grew up around gangsters and bank robbers and all kind of folks. I'm one of nine kids. Like I have six brothers and two sisters. So it was a lot of us. And my father wasn't in the picture. My father was murdered when I was eight years old. 
the only male figures in my life were my brothers, older brothers, um, and then the neighborhood. I didn't know anything, didn't know how to play the game. I, they gave me shoulder pads and they hey, gave me a helmet and gave me a face mask and said, he, you know, I had to put my face mask together. This is junior college. I put it on backwards somehow. I don't even know how that happened. But <laughs> the coach grabs it and says, hey, puts it together. And, and I end up starting as a freshman. Football became that oasis for me, for my everyday life. My everyday life was hard. So when we had practice, and people were talking about how hard practice is. And, you know, you go along and get on, get along and say, hey, yeah, right. yeah, it was hard. That was a hard practice. But in my head, I'm like, this ain't hard. Like, this is, this is a cakewalk. Like, you wouldn't have to, you wouldn't even go to my neighborhood and drop me off. I spent every waking moment thinking about it and doing it. And that helped me become a better student. Like, it was something, it gave me something to latch on to because if I didn't have the grades, I couldn't play football, right? And then it was, oh, somebody's going to offer you a scholarship. Well, you're good enough to play in college. And I started getting letters from different colleges. And I'm like, well, okay, well, what do I need to do to graduate? And so I had great coaches, great people around me that gave me the advice that I needed. The counselors saying, oh, you need to graduate from JUCO, and this is how you do it. And so I took an insane amount of credits every year semester like I took 21 units a semester I needed 60 to graduate in two years so I graduated with more credits than I ever need I still haven't it made up for the high school it made up for high school I volunteer at the high school and help coach football because football was that thing that that changed me changed my life and brought me to this point um the people that coached me, the friends that I made, the friends that I have now helped me become the man that I am. And it wasn't just me. So I feel like I have the society part is I have an obligation to give that back. Is your story different than theirs? Yeah, uh, it's, and... uh, it's a lot different, you know, because they actually at a young age got to grow up in their town. You know, I started out in my town, but obviously my dad was Air Force. So we moved every three years. Um, you know, I hated it. You know, you meet friends, you get a new school system, uh, you get acclimated to a team, and then you're moving. But, uh, you know, my first love for the game came from my mom. My mom played flag football, and I used to go to her games. Wow. And, oh, wow. Yeah, she Way played ahead flag of time. football. Yeah, and uh, what happened was she, uh, <laughs> when they would call timeouts and there was any time there was a break in the action, I used to run out. She said, I used to take the ball and run with it. And they used to have to chase me to get the ball back to start play. And then it was just like, man, this kid is crazy. Like, you know, he loves the game. So that's where I really found my love for the game. And and my dad, who's been just like, he's my hero. He's my my mentor. You know, he's he's been the constant, you know, the one that's always pushed me to, you know, strive for excellence in everything. And that comes from, obviously, his military background. That's how I was raised, to strive for excellence, to be elite in everything you do, or to achieve, you know, that greatness in everything you do. And, uh, you know, he always told me, he said, hey, you know what? We're moving from place to place, but the great equalizer is sports. So I knew that if I was good at sports, I would be accepted into different communities. I would make friends faster, you know, because sports was that key. Uh, sports was that, that gateway to make friends, to be accepted and things of that nature. So, you know, that's where I took a love, love of the game. You know, I always tried to push myself, I always, you know, tried to compete. I tried to beat everybody out, always competing in everything I did, whether it's in school, walking up the hallway. I wanted to be first walking up the hallway, you know, just, just trying to compete at a high level just to fit in at first. And then uh, when I went to high school, my high school football coach, Don Cobb, was the one who said, you know what, like, you got a chance to take this a long way. You know, you can play this game, you know, you're disciplined, you work hard, you can take this a long way. And I'm glad he said that because <laughs> my freshman year, I, re I remember my dad telling me, he said, look, he said, you're on the clock. I'm like, well, what does that mean? He's like, well, you got four years to get a scholarship, whether it's academic or athletic. He's like, one, because I don't have money for college. <laughs> Not for you. For, I have money, but it ain't for college. It ain't for you. <laughs> so I looked at my mom, and I'm like, is he serious right now? And she's like, yeah, you heard him. I was like, man, I got to get a scholarship. Somehow. So, uh, you know, my, my high school coach told me that I had the ability to do so. That really, you know, motivated me and gave me the confidence that I could, you know, go a long way. And then having the opportunity to go to college, to go to Temple University, 
uh, I had an opportunity to have a great position coach by the name of Blair Thomas, who was a running back. From where? From Penn State. Oh, okay. from from little Penn State okay. University. Now, from okay. Penn State University, he was second over, overall pick, and um, you know he was a guy who you know, had been in the NFL. He was somewhere that I wanted to go, and you know he ran he ran our meetings that way. He held us to that standard, and everything we did in terms of practice and preparation was on NFL level. So, you know, I think having him as that coach, that mentor, uh, when I was at, when I was in college, uh, made the transition easier. Uh, you know, being an undrafted free agent you know, like me and Cat and you know Rashid, like you only know you only have one speed. You know, you only get so many opportunities to mess up. So, and I was like Cat. You know, everything was full speed, walk through, whatever. I'm full speed, all out, because I'm trying to get to where these guys are. I don't have time to take a playoff. Like you guys have a spot on this roster, I'm trying to take one. So, you know, that just helped prepare me and help make that transition easier. And then. You know, just just the mindset and mentality and just the morals and values that my father instilled in me just just helped me, you know, be able to overcome adversity and be able to acclimate to any type of adversity that I was facing. So, you know, not all of my parents, honestly, my parents, they, they did everything. As you know each other now, as you knew each other as teammates when you are young and having fun, did any of you see coaching in anybody's future in this room? No, 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 no. I always heard this term though. You don't have to like your coach, but you got to respect them. But they also have to earn your respect and vice versa. Is that in this current environment we live in, in 2023 and the youth of America at this point, is it, is it difficult to manage that? And is it That's a, a question for these, these head coaches. Yeah. Because <laughs> I can't, I can't deal kids. with this stuff that, that Jason goes through. As a head coach, dealing with the parents, and then like mm -hmm. the kids, now it's like, if you go through something, I'm transferring, or I'm playing baseball now, or I'm doing this, I'm doing that. Like, mm -hmm. when we was coming up, we, we had no problem with working to get to the starting position. Now it's like, oh, well, I'm, tra I'm not starting, I'm transferring, I'm out of here. Like, I, like, I don't wanna have to do that. I specifically stuff. remember the sentiment from a lot of my friends growing up, like from your dad, like you go to practice and you don't give that man any problems. I don't want to hear anything. That's not the, that's not the, that's not how they're being taught today. But specifically that was the understanding that if you went to practice and this man took out his time to teach you, it doesn't matter how hard he was on you. Don't come home with any problems. That that's how guys, that's, that's the, the era I grew up in. It's, well, it's if you come to practice with us, I'll try to make you quit. You can you can tell him, he'll tell you, like, I'll try to make you quit if you're gonna give us problems. I'll try to make you quit. Like, you, we don't deal with no problems at, like, Carmel very much because we don't stand for it. Like, and the parents know, if your kid comes out to practice and he's getting detentions at school and Jason don't play, he sends them to me, I'll try to make them quit. Um, if you don't give us problems, we don't need you. We'll play with 11, we'll play with 22. Um, we'll go to fight with those kids that wanna be there um, because it's just not worth it to us. Yeah, it's setting an example. I mean, we've had to remove kids from the team who could have really helped us just because of their athleticism, you know, just because of how good they were in terms of the game. but. In terms of the people they were off the field, it was going to hurt us more. And those are tough decisions because, you know, at, at the end of the day, you're looking at the results. Football is a results based business. So this kid can help us win games, but at the end of the day, this kid is going to, you know, bring our standard down. He's going to affect our culture and stuff like that. So, like, it was those tough decisions. And, you know, same thing with the parents. It's like, hey, you know what? You're, you know, your son or daughter doesn't get playing time based upon you being an alum here, you know, you being on the board. Everything's earned. And that's just the way it is. And that's the standard that we've set. And just got a great group of, uh, group of coaches around that kind of echoes that same mentality. And that's why his weight room looked like the way it do. Because people are like, here, man. Here, here. Listen, you got one of the biggest schools in the area. You can't, you, wait, you, what are you talking yeah, about? What are you talking you about? You see that field house? Amai, what is he talking about? They got a field house. We don't count. We don't count, though. We don't count. What is he talking about? It's a college about? campus over there. I got to bring up Olin Krutz because yeah. he was a great teammate. He, he, I, he was a teammate of all you guys, right? Yeah, you got there too. Yeah, he was there in '98. I, I I could always envision him being a coach and just a 
tough, tough, but also there's a side of him that maybe he don't want to ever let see, but that guy cares. 100%. How impactful, oh, man, he's how been, impactful. He's been huge, like, just, just coaching with him. No, he coached in uh, middle school, uh, St. Mary's, right, Kat? Always, yeah, St. Mary's, and he, so, he's, he used to always ask me, like, Jimmy, can you come out and help me with special teams and offense? So he's he always all of us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We always <laughs> go out there me. and help him out. And, uh, like, he, I mean, even when I first started at Carmel, I was like, man, I need help with the O-line. I called Brother O. I said, Brother O, man, I need you. Can you come out and help? Oh, no problem. So he came out the first day. So I'll come out and help. Came out the first day, and he came back out the second day. And he was like, hey, I'm locked in. You know, I'm locked in. I was like, yes, like, good. But, I mean, the way he is as a coach, as you know, he's just, his mental, his mental aptitude of the game is so high. Um, you know, just in terms of what he does with offensive line development, like he knows the game like a back of his hand. He makes everybody better. But what people don't see is the things that, he, that he's done personally. I mean, he bought a drone with his own money to help us film practice. He paid for, you know, a film crew to film end zone of our practices. Like things like that's the stuff that people don't see. You know, people have their, they have their opinion about Olin, but, you know, he'll give you the shirt off his back. And he's done a lot of those things. Like, though our offensive line, like, they, they would run through a brick wall for Coach Cruz. Uh, you know, I would too. That's the way he was as a teammate. Um, you know, he's the ultimate teammate, but he's, he's just a solid person, you know. And I, I mean, He's just helped us so much. He's made me a better coach. I know he's made Coach Davis he's a better coach. He's made me a better coach. He's always cussing me out. Yeah. <laughs> he's made our program better. He's made us better. Just in terms of the contributions, the things you don't see. I mean, he's done a lot for the program. You guys are all Bears who stayed in the Chicago area. Certainly you were a Chicagoan uh, and now giving back to the community. Did you guys need this as much as the kids need you? For me, it's, it's a way to keep me in touch. You know, it, it, it literally keeps me in touch. Um, you know, I went to Lake Forest when my son was a senior. That was my first year ever coaching there. And I had coached at a couple of places prior to that. But um, having the opportunity to, you know, work with him a little closer. Also being able to you know, sit down and have that chat with him. You know, how will it be for you as a player knowing that I'm a coach? You know, he was like, I really don't care. He was like, you know, it'll, it'll work for me. You know, but, you know, his friends were like, damn, dude, your dad is mean. <laughs> He's like, hey, yeah. hey, you know, He's it, a teddy bear. It, well, it, it's funny because, you know, I I remember, you know, like one of the summer practices my first time there. And I'm yelling at this kid. And I talked to Jai to practice and he's like, I didn't even notice it. <laughs> I, was like, yeah, I, I get it because you get it at home you know what I mean so yes this this has been good for me uh mentally physically and on all levels definitely good for me I, I had a chance to coach my son for four years straight all of high school so definitely brought us together and uh did you did you cry his last game I got emotional I don't know if it streamed down my face, but I got emotional. It did. It did. It did. It did. Yeah. I'm sorry. But yeah, definitely. Just football, just being around football centers me. It centers me. It gives me a better life. No, I was just asking because I felt like I'm going to cry. You are going to cry. Yeah. I think I am. I know I'm going to cry. You are going to cry. I think I'm going to cry, man. Like, I, I gave him a hug, like, during warm-ups and stuff like that, and I was like, ooh. Shoot, uh, got one more year. Dang. Yeah, I got, mine's got one yeah, more. Got it's, it's, it's a different fun. feeling, like, when you, you know, you get a whole different level of excitement. There's a different feeling when you see your kid out there playing. And my oldest son played college ball. That was a different Jordan, feeling. Man. Yeah, you see him oh out there. God. He's been through He's been through a lot of adversity. Yeah. And just to see him out there, uh, being able to play the ball. game again and being able to play at a high level is good. You know, it's awesome. Like, it's it's definitely a blessing. And then, you know, with some of the other kids we have in our program, too, like a lot of these kids I've known since middle school. So to have them, you know, be over there with us playing, like, it's definitely going to be tough to see those kids graduate and move on. But at the same time, being able to, you know, hopefully give them something that can help them be successful in their life, not just in terms of the game of football, but in their life is going to be you know, even better if we we're able to do that. I think it's therapeutic for us. You know what I'm saying? Like, you get, I guess, a reason why you go back. I guess a reason why Olin came back the second day and then the third day and stuff like that. Because it's like, I, I would show the kids different things and they like, oh, how can you, how do you do that? Like, da, da, da. It's like, 
I just look like this, all right? Like, I could still <laughs> move around and things like that. Like, I remember they, they had a play where, you know, you line up at defensive end, right? You line up at a five technique, but you end up at a four. So you got to, like, scoot down to get to a four. And I'm telling them, like, hey, you got to be ready because the offensive line is already ready. So how you do that is you just you bear crawl into it. And they're like, well, what do you mean you bear crawl? So I show them, and then they like, <laughs> How do, how do you, I'm like, dude, I, You're Thomas I, I, I Edison do this. this. Like, did y'all know that? Like, I, Light bulb went off. Yeah, like, dude, I played professionally for nine years. Like, I've pretty much seen it all. So, you know, I showed them little things, and they're just like, wow, how did you find out that fast? I'm like, you know how many times we've ran this play? You know how many times they ran a stretch or a bootleg? Like, dude, like, I know what the play is at the snap of the ball. You and know I know funny. that through experience. You know what's funny about this last part of the conversation is you asked us earlier, did we know certain guys were going to be coaches? None of us were like this when we played. Uh, correct. You know what I mean? The people I only played with these two and the people that I played with were a lot different than, and, and, and they'll, they'll tell you the same thing yeah. about me. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Right. But, Children mature us, yeah. uh, you know, life yeah. matures us. Yeah. So it's it's interesting sitting around, and I get reminded of it on a regular basis by someone that, you know, I, I need the big cat answer, not the James Williams answer. <laughs> there, there was a reason I asked all of you guys about your backgrounds, and I didn't know if you guys were going to get into it and in depth as you did, because clearly it's it's deeply rooted in you guys and it's emotional and it's it's like your benchmark to where you that your platform do all your kids know about this your, your own kids and the kids you coach have you explained these stories because it's impactful they get tired of hearing me talk <laughs> <laughs> the, the only time they'll find it out or the only attention span they have is if you put it on TikTok. Other than that, then they, they're not going to sit there and listen to it. I mean, I hope they watch this because if it's on TikTok, I was watching watch you it. guys listen to each other's stories and I'm seeing the head bob. I'm seeing like, did you even know about all this about each other? Yeah. 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 I didn't know yeah. about a lot of them. Football. I didn't know about that. I was surprised. Yeah. I knew your mom was nicer than you. <laughs> she was nice, man. Hey. Yeah. She always says, I got the, the, I got the biggest trophy in the house. house. I swear. Drop That's off her claim to fame. Going back to the question of why we do it, these guys will learn. I mean, I, I think this is my 12th year, I think, 11 or 12. You get to a point where it doesn't stop. It's never like, when does it end? Because you got, you know, like J Mac said, you, you'll start with a group of freshmen. And you start with them throughout their entire career. Well, another group has already started behind those guys. And you can never say, I'm going to stop, because now you can't let that group yeah. before you that you've kind of resonated with as well. So it's like, well, you don't want to let these kids down ever, because that's why we do it. We don't get paid to do this, right? So we don't want to let them, with, let them down. So at what point are you like, all right, well, Charlie, I really love that kid, but He's a senior. I guess I got to retire. I'm not going to see you through your your career. So next thing you know, it's going to be 15 years later. Yeah. You know what I mean? And you're going to enjoy it just as much because it's just new kids coming in each time and you get those relationships. Life's second act for you guys. This is You're looking at 748 career NFL games right here, including playoffs. I did the math. Wow. So wow. it's a lot, of, a lot of knowledge and a lot of hard knocks and a lot of growing up. Yeah. Appreciate you guys. Appreciate what you do. Did Thank you get you. to all your questions? I didn't get to any. <laughs> I, swear, I swear. Keep it organic. I, That's the best way. I didn't get to any. You don't need a script. But your stories are moving, and not everybody's got this path. So hats off for keeping grinding and having the careers you had and the men that you've become.